Hello, I'm Joel Woodruff, president of the C.S. Lewis Institute. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this CSLI live stream event with Nancy Guthrie, titled Praying for Others During Times of Suffering. If this is your first CSLI event, or if you've been a regular attending our events, I encourage you to take a moment later to subscribe to our free digital discipleship resources through our website and to follow us on social media. You can click on the chat room bottom at the bottom of your Zoom screen to find links to CSLI resources and our website. The C.S. Lewis Institute was founded 46 years ago as a servant ministry to the church for the purpose of helping develop disciples of Jesus Christ who will articulate, defend, share, and live their faith in personal and public life. Our Heart and Mind Discipleship Ministry now has 17 locations in the United States, Canada, and Northern Ireland. And people around the world download and use the small group resources, articles, audio and video materials, and podcasts available through our website. Our flagship program, the year-long tuition-free C.S. Lewis Fellows Program, has equipped over 5,000 men and women to date to become effective disciples of Jesus Christ, who are equipped to effectively live out their faith. The program includes Bible study, lectures, mentoring, small groups, and training in spiritual formation, conversational apologetics, and evangelism to develop servant leaders for the workplace, church, and home. And it's designed so that busy working professionals can complete the program while maintaining their work, church, and family life. Let me just share the locations in which this fellows program is going to be offered in 2022. Annapolis, Maryland, Atlanta, Belfast, Northern Ireland, Central Pennsylvania, Charleston, South Carolina, our newest, Chicago, Charlotte, North Carolina, Cincinnati, Dallas, Greenville, South Carolina, Loudoun County, Virginia, Naples, Florida, Northeast Ohio, Virginia Beach, Seattle, Toronto, Ontario, and Washington, D.C. If you live in one of these areas and would like more information on the program for men and women ages 24 to 94, please check our website. The 22-23 classes application period will open on February 1st. Today, we're so grateful to be able to use the Zoom webinar for this event as it enables us to broadcast all over the world. And I was able to meet our guest, Nancy Guthrie, earlier to pre-record this interview. It's a good thing as snowstorms have made it difficult to arrange travel in recent days. I've been doing these kind of live stream videos over the past couple of years, but my interview with Nancy may be the most powerful and inspiring one to date. I believe that you'll be strengthened in your faith and better equipped to come alongside others who may be suffering and hurting after hearing from Nancy. Now, would you please join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we ask this evening that you would bless this uh, pre-recorded interview with Nancy Guthrie. Speak through her uh, words, and we pray, Lord, that we would be able to pick up insights and helps to be able to come alongside others who may be suffering. We're so grateful, Lord, for the scriptures, for your word, which is able to give us solace and strength in times of difficulty. And so we ask for your blessing upon this evening. Help all who are logging in all over the world to be able to easily access this broadcast. And we pray that you'd bless our time together. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's go to the interview with author and speaker, Nancy Guthrie. Hello, I'm Joel Woodruff, president of the C.S. Lewis Institute. And it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to this interview with best-selling author and Bible teacher, Nancy Guthrie. Uh, over the past 20 years since Nancy published her first book, she's become known as uh, a very thoughtful uh, proclaimer of God's Word. She has a deep love for Scripture. And uh, many of her books have uh, really been known as, uh, as books that have centered on biblical theology. She has some wonderful books, uh, one titled Discovering Jesus in the Old Testament and Abundant Life in Jesus. And these books have helped many people go deeper into the themes of Scripture and the, the deeper truths. But I know that Nancy and her husband David are also known for their uh, ability to share deeply as well on uh, how God has worked in and through their lives uh, following great loss and sorrow. Um, and so uh, their transparency and their ability to communicate uh, how God has worked in their lives has touched the lives of many. And they've also, uh, Nancy has, uh, as a result, has written a number of books in helping people deal with sorrow, trauma, and loss. And one of them is her newest book. It's this one here, I'm Praying for You, 40 Days of Praying the Bible for Someone Who is Suffering. 
Uh, this is probably one of the most practical and helpful books you will ever find in learning how to come alongside those in your life who may be hurting or suffering. And so it's a pleasure to welcome Nancy uh, to our uh, uh, time together. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Joel. So glad to be with you and all who are joining us online. Well, Nancy, you know, here we are at the C.S. Lewis Institute, and C.S. Lewis himself... But that's, that kind of intimidates me up the <laughs> oh, start, no. I should tell you. <laughs> well, no, it, no, it shouldn't. Uh, uh, C.S. Lewis, I think for us, we're named after him because he was a lay person, first mm. of all. He wasn't uh, trained as a pastor or theologian, and yet he himself, when he came to Christ, really did a good job of integrating mm. both heart and mind. He used mm. his head, but he also his heart. And one thing we appreciate about your writings is your ability to do that. Mm. Uh, and uh, C.S. Lewis himself like you, wrote about pain and suffering. Mm. Interesting, his f first book was The Problem of Pain, yeah. uh, which was, I think, more of an intellectual head side, trying to answer some of the greater questions of, you know, why does God allow suffering in the world? But then his second book, A Grief Observed, mm. dealt a lot more with the heart side. What it, after he lost his wife, Joy, mm. and what did it feel like? And, mm. and so we kind of just had those two sides of heart and mind. You yourself, I know, mm. uh, have experienced loss, and yet uh, you've done a great job, I think, of integrating heart and mind in your teaching and your writing. And I wonder if you could share a little bit of your story with us. First of all, how did you get to be a person that even talked about these topics and, and difficult subjects? Yeah. Well, I, I went to a, I grew up in a Christian home. I went to a Christian college and I got a job working in a Christian publishing company right out of college. And uh -huh. people would always ask me, you know, are you going to write a book someday? Uh -huh. And I would always say, I will never know enough about one thing to write a whole book about it. Mm. I mean, so it wasn't that I aspired to write yeah, necessarily. So. Mm. Um, my first book came, came out in 2002. And the way that came about was um, in 1998, we had a son, our son Matt, who was eight at the time. Mm -hmm. And I gave birth to a daughter named Hope. Mm. And Hope was born uh, immediately. It was noticeable there were what the doctor called a number of small problems. She I was very lethargic. She was a little underweight. Um, her hands turned slightly out. She had a really large soft spot and extra skin on her neck. So all these little things. And the pediatrician said to her, said to us on that first night, you know, a lot of times when there's a number of little things wrong, mm. they add up to something more significant. So I'm going to have a geneticist come and take a look at her tomorrow. So he came to our room that next night, and he told us that he suspected Hope had a rare metabolic disorder that we had never heard of, and probably none of you have either, um, called Zellweger syndrome, mm. which meant that she was missing a tiny subcellular particle, an enzyme, in every cell that you and I have in every yeah. cell. And this enzyme is responsible for ridding the cells of long-chain fatty acids. And so that geneticist explained that night because she was missing these peroxisomes that in a sense there was nobody to take out the trash in her cells mm -hmm. and because of that uh, these toxins had built up in all of her cells all of her systems and had already affected all of her major organs including her liver and her kidneys and her brain and he told us that there was no treatment and no cure and that most children with that syndrome live less than six months which was devastating. And uh, I remember my husband, David, crawled into the hospital bed with me, and we cried. And we cried out to God probably the most unceremonious prayer we'd ever prayed, which was just simply, God, help us. We don't know what to do. Um, the reality of Hope's life was really those first days were her best. Um, uh, she, you know, she was continually... Um, manifesting more uh, of the problems related to this. So what was great was that, you know, we were able to take her home mm -hmm. and enjoy her. Of course, mm -hmm. taking her home wasn't even what we expected. You know, sure. I had I, really looked forward to having a daughter to grow old with me, you know, to be my friend in my old age. And I'd looked forward to taking her home to grow up with us. And instead, when we took her home, we knew we were taking her home to die. And that reality just began to be more and more real to me. As I as I remember it hitting me one day, Joel, just a few weeks in and just realizing, okay, I mean, we we know everyone's going to die, even though like we like to deny that, sure. right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, I remember it just hit me that hope it was going to be soon, relatively soon, that either... Uh, 
Hope was going to die in my arms or I would find her dead. And that really scared me. Sure. Uh, I wasn't sure how I would deal with that. And I wondered if, if that would be the only memories I would have of her. So her life, it's hard to explain, Joel, but it was such a mixture of joy and sorrow, of loss and incredible richness, because it was really all of those things. There's, there's something about life when you know it's short. I mean, David and I felt like we learned for the first time what people mean when they talk about taking one day at a time. Because just every day, we didn't know if that would be her last, and that was in some ways a great way to live. Some ways we missed living that way after she was gone. Um, but it, and I tried not to borrow too much on the sadness, I, because I, I, I just thought to myself, okay, if I allow myself to get too sad now, I'll miss her life. And then I'll regret that the rest of my life. And so really her days with us were really rich. We were able to share her with lots of people and she went with us everywhere we went and um, we enjoyed her and we loved her. And uh, God gave us 199 days with her. And uh, she slipped away from us in the middle of the night. And, uh, I, you know, I think that I had thought, Joel, that, like, I'm a planner. I, I plan ahead on things, you know. And I, I think somehow I thought that spending those six months of her life knowing that she was going to die that somehow I was getting a jump on the grief and that maybe then grief wouldn't be so hard for me. Uh, and it just didn't work that way <laughs> at all. You know, hope was gone and our lives, were, there was just this huge empty place in our lives. Um, and it's amazing how heavy empty can feel. I, 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 the best way I've always known how to describe it is that to me it just felt like this huge boulder on my chest of heaviness and sadness and disappointment, um, like I could hardly ever take a breath. And um, I was just sad. I was just sad for a really long time, really deep, pervasive sadness. Now, now I have a child with this syndrome means that both my husband, David, and I must be carriers of a recessive gene trait. Do you remember a uh, high school genetics class, and you learned what it took yeah, to have blue right. eyes. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You know about that. Yeah, uh, that's right. That, that you know that um, both parents have to be carriers of the mm -hmm. recessive gene trait, and then when they have a child, that child has a twenty-five percent chance of having blue eyes. Well, it's similar to us. So mm -hmm. once we had hope, we knew then that we were both carriers, and that we had a whenever we have a child, that child would have a twenty-five percent chance of having this fatal syndrome. And so that meant we had some difficult decisions to make about whether or not we would have more children. And in so many ways, our family didn't feel complete. And also, because we had loved and enjoyed hope, our, we did not immediately think, oh, we could never risk going through that again. But also, you know, our lives weren't just us. There was our son, Matt, who had, you know, he had experienced six months living in a household waiting for his sibling to die. And then a lot longer than that with a really sad mom, which I promise you couldn't have been much fun. Um, and then there was our parents. And, you know, as hard as it is to lose a child, I think it's doubly difficult to watch your child lose a child. And you've got nothing in your toolkit that you can pull out to fix that. So it had been devastating for our parents. And so we determined that we would take surgical steps to prevent another pregnancy. And evidently it didn't work. Mm. And about a year and a half after Hope died, I discovered I was pregnant, which I was shocked to put it mildly, sure. as was David. Yeah. And, um, you know, if in our experience with Hope, if we had asked the question why, and I don't think anybody suffers without asking that question, you know, this time it's like, why again? Like, you know, was there something we were supposed to learn that first time around that we didn't learn? Um, and it was so interesting, Joel, people around us, you know, people of, of faith. But, you know, oftentimes faith in our modern Christian world is defined as I've got enough faith 
to believe and to call upon, pound the doors of heaven to get a miracle, you know, to, to uh, win God to our side, to the outcome that we think is best. And um, I would challenge that as in terms of a version of faith. I, I, I've come to think that what faith really is, is faith is um, saying to God, I, I belong to you and I believe you are in charge and that you are work, at work in this world and in my life for my good and for your glory. And that um, I can trust you with whatever you allow into my life. And that I will still love you, even if you don't uh, order my life according to my plans. Mm. I think that's the definition of faith. Yeah. But anyway, so, you know, I knew I was pregnant. And so we, we went through prenatal testing. And I discovered when I was about 15 weeks pregnant then that we were going to have a son this time. And that he would also have the fatal mm. disorder. So our son Gabriel was born in July of 2001. And... Initially, we thought maybe he was a little stronger than Hope was, that he might be with us a little longer. He was actually with us a few days less, 186 mm. days. Mm. And then we said goodbye to him. Mm. And there we were, once again, mm. back to a family of three, you know, in, in, in one sense, just feeling like, what has happened? I mean, mm. I got to be honest with you, Joel. Sometimes I still, I mean, this is 20 years ago now, which is wild to me. Sometimes I just shake my head. I said, I just think that really happened. You know, it was um, it was profound. It was such a mixture of joy and sorrow. Um, it has so shaped me in who I am and how I think and what I believe. You know, I, I think experiences like this, Joel, they they really cause us to figure out not just what we think we ought to believe, but what we really believe. Mm -hmm. And it's the place where I figured out not only what I really believe, but that what I believe matters. Mm -hmm. And that in fact, it makes all the difference in the world in facing living in a world that is so very broken because of the curse of sin. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much just for sharing the uh, story because that was just such, well, it's such a, uh, uh, we certainly feel with you as you, mm -hmm. you share that. It's, it, it, I think uh, anyone who hears that could feel, feel the depth of, uh, you know, that, of your pain and suffering and, and asking why, mm -hmm. I'm sure yeah. for God. Uh, I think many of us, you know, even just me hearing your story, uh, you know, we oftentimes struggle, you know, how, how can I, uh, when I hear a story like that, how can I come around someone who's who's hurting, and um, uh, have there been people in your life, perhaps, who have modeled uh, care mm. for those who are suffering? And if so, what, you know, who, what, what do those people do? What, what do they look like? What, you know, what? That's a great way to ask that question. I'm not sure many people have asked it to me in that way, because they usually just assume, what are the bad things people have done? Sure. You know, <laughs> yeah. and, you know well, how have they things. failed? Sure. And, and yeah. honestly, I haven't known a grieving person who hasn't had a list that they could give you pretty sure. long in that sure. regard. But when I think back to that time, actually, you will get me crying with this because that <laughs> is where I am so moved. Mm. When I think about people who showed mm. up mm. for me, mm. <laughs> in fact, just last weekend, I was I got mm. on a plane and there was this an old friend of mine who was on the same flight. I never see her anymore, mm -hmm. but she's one of those people who was there for me. I mean, mm. she's one of the people I just, I, as I remember, she might have even been the first person I told that Hope was going to die when she came to see me at the hospital. And I just remember her eyes welling up with tears and her just weeping with me. And, uh, boy, that's maybe the number one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think most of us feel so awkward around other people mm -hmm. suffering. And some of it's just a social awkwardness that we, we mm -hmm. like it when we have a conversation with someone that it ends upbeat. Yes, yes. That everything ends up kind of tidy, Yeah. right? And when you're interacting with a suffering person, that's often not the case. I think, yeah, especially when you're interacting with someone who's dealing, who's, who's in a situation where it is not going to get better. Mm -hmm. You know, a terminal yeah. situation yeah. quite often, 
or other other situations that you just realize it's it's not on a trajectory toward just a mm -hmm. well, hey it'll, right yeah. we'll just be happy about it no it's hard it's probably only get get harder and so some of the awkwardness comes out of just our desire to or have things turn out well but when I think back you know there was there was both I guess there's two two uh, sections of time, or maybe even more than that, in, in regard to my experience, because there was the way people current came around us during Hope's life. I remember one of the best things that a friend, a friend did was that, you know, a lot of times you're going through something hard and you've got all these people who come from all these directions who want to help. And just managing people wanting to help mm -hmm. can be overwhelming, especially when you're dealing with something hard. And I remember I had one friend who kind of stepped up, like anybody mm -hmm. who wanted to come to my house or do kind of practical things to help, she was the contact. And another one was a mm -hmm. contact for meals, you know? Mm -hmm. And so just anybody who said they wanted to help me, say, talk to them. Mm -hmm. And they organized it. I mean, mm -hmm. that was a great wow. gift to me. I, it was a great gift to me. I think about my friend, Julie, who I wasn't really close friends with. And I think this is another important thing. I think a lot of times we don't approach someone who's suffering because we think to ourselves, you know what, they've got friends who are closer friends mm -hmm. than I am. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm sure those people are who they want mm -hmm. and who are around them. You know what? Close friends sometimes don't know how to handle us. I mean, the two couples that we called to the hospital and told this news to, both of those couples disappeared in our lives. But the Lord brought us other people who stepped in, like my friend Julie. I remember mm. she just she mm. she contacted me. She said, um, "I have Mondays mm. every Monday off. I'd like to come every Monday and do whatever you can do. Whatever." <laughs> Here's what got me, Joel, because I want to know hope. Wow. You know, I didn't have any choice but love hope. Yeah. Who was going to die? She did. She wanted to know her. And she did, you know, and I, and then I remember the first Monday after Hope's death, getting an email from Julie, it's Monday and I miss Hope. And um, that was profound. So as I think about, the, you know, there's that stepping in in those difficult days. I think it's a little bit different, especially dealing with someone who's in the midst of grief. The being with them can look a little bit different, although doing practical things to help is important. Probably the most important thing is being a good listener rather than a good talker. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of us are intimidated by being around grieving people because we think, I don't know what to say. Yeah. And you know what? If you had something to say that would make, like, fix it, um, then maybe you should be worried of, about what to say. But it's actually shows great honor to someone who's grieving for you to come around. Maybe the only thing you can say is, I don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that, that's humble. It says this is bigger and harder than mere words mm -hmm. could fix. And so to sometimes just come around, have a listening ear, and to also learn how to ask good questions. You know, I think the most natural question that comes, we, we see someone in the narthex, narthex of the church, you know, is going through something. And what's the first thing we would say? How are you? And it's not a terrible thing, except that if we try to put ourselves in the shoes of someone we ask that to, they feel like they've got to give a report. And deep down, they know that what you really want is a good report. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so I think it's sometimes better to ask a different kind of question, uh, like for someone who's grieving, to maybe ask the question, what's your grief like these days? I mean, in many ways, it's the same question, right? But there's something about that that says, I'm not shocked that you're grieving. It makes sense to me that you would be grieving. And I'm just inviting you to talk with me about what it's like, good, bad, or otherwise. So the, the skill of asking good questions, the skill of listening, and, and specifically in terms of, uh, of grief, of a loss of someone, to say that person's name, that's the thing grieving people want most. To so not just say your daughter, your son, your mother, your brother, Hope, Gabe, to say that person's name because th they've stopped hearing that person's name and some people feel awkward about it. And so to say that person's name, to, to express that you miss that person too, if, that, if that's fitting for you. 
all those things. Um, I'll just give one general principle, though, as we leave that discussion. Sure, though, here's as you think about it in terms of should I say this or should I, well, you know, think in terms does it esteem that person's loss or does it diminish it? Mm -hmm. Run it through that grid. Mm -hmm. You know, um, to esteem their loss is to demonstrate that person was important, thereby, therefore, the grief that they feel over there is significant. To diminish it is to make it about us. Or to make about, I know a story about somebody else who this happened to, or uh, or that kind of look on the bright side kind of things, like, well, at least, at least you can have more children, at least you can get married again. Those are things that diminish loss. And so as we interact with grieving people, especially yeah. we want to think, what would esteem that loss? And that can help us judge whether or not that thing that is on the tip of our tongue is something that we should swallow <laughs> or just go ahead and say. Yeah, no, that's that's, that's uh, really helpful to think about it that way. It, it, as far as this, this whole process of coming alongside, I mean, how how long does the grief process come on? Like, I mean, well, as a friend, see. can I can I you know, two months later feel oh. it's all gone or what? Or oh, what, what, what a what good you... question. Yeah, um, yeah. I <laughs> I do think that is a a common misunderstanding, and I, I find myself even falling into that trap again. Uh, that we think, okay, it's been a while. And so we think that, that they should be better not by now or they are better than by now. We think it's been too long to bring it up. You know what? <laughs> um, most people in the midst of a loss, they, they start marking time by that loss. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think uh, if you really want to be a good friend to a grieving person, when that loss happens, write it on your calendar and, and, and put a little, I mean, we all carry one around with us all the time on our phone, right? So we put we mark the three month date and the six month date and the nine month date and the one year date and the two year date, mm -hmm. and then on those days it doesn't have to be some big grand show, mm -hmm. you know. I still have a handful of friends who on Hope's death day and Gabe's gift death day, I get a little text or an email thinking about you today. Mm -hmm. We remember. I mean, there's nothing that gets me more than that. We I ha we haven't forgotten yet. You know, and Hope would be 23 next week. And Gabe would be 21. And so uh, to just let people know you haven't forgotten. I, but it's interesting you bring that up because I'm thinking about that right now. Uh, um, a lady, one of our deacons at my church died. And I'm thinking August. And I keep kicking myself because I haven't. I've spoken to her, but I haven't sent her something in writing. Mm -hmm. And every time I think about it, my first thing is, well, it's been a while. But then I just... Remember, no, she got a big rush of cards mm -hmm. there at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But will anybody note that three-month mark? Mm -hmm. Or heading into Thanksgiving and Christmas to send her a note. So that's become my goal, mm -hmm. to get her one before Thanksgiving that just says, you know, as you head into this holiday season, mm -hmm. I know that somebody important is missing at the table. Mm -hmm. And that it will be so hard to hear all of those happy Thanksgiving and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year because there's just a huge hole in your heart and in your home and in your family and in your future. And I just want you to know that we haven't forgotten him, that David is very much still on our hearts and minds and the fact that you and your kids are facing these holidays without him. We're hurting with you. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's very helpful. Uh, just the idea of writing uh, notes to and, and communicating with people and that, that way, I'm sure it's very, very helpful. It's a skill us. that I didn't learn and I still struggle with, but boy, do they have power. Get something in the mail from somebody. And they took the time to write me and find my address and put on a stamp. And it means a lot. Yeah. Well, there's this, uh, there's coming alongside others outside of our family, but, you know, being in a family, how do, how do you help, you know, how did you help your son? How do you help mm. your spouse, uh, you know, those who are, suffering with you in the midst. How can you That's together? That's a big question, Joel. Yeah. yeah, I don't pretend to be an expert on helping children through grief. I just parented one mm -hmm. yeah. unique kid through it, you mm -hmm. know, so I don't set myself as an expert. But the only thing I do think I have figured out about that is that we, we're often so uptight about what we're going to say to our kids, how we're mm -hmm. going to explain mm -hmm. things to them. Mm -hmm. And the truth is our kids are watching us. Yeah. And that's the most profound communication for them in regard to grief and loss and how they should think and feel about it. 
Um, so I, I just tell parents, you know, if you're angry and hopeless, your kids are probably going to follow your lead, you know? If you're sad, but confident in God's goodness, you probably will follow your lead in that too. So it's much more. And the other thing, it's not its not only what they see in you, it's what they overhear you say to other adults. <laughs> sure. Right? Because you know how that is. Oh, yeah. That's who we speak the truth to, what we really think. And so, you know, what they overhear you say to other adults about how you're thinking, processing, all of these things, um, that's probably how they're going to do it. Uh, in, in terms of a spouse, you know, sorrow, the challenge of this is figuring out how to be sad, how to feel lonely together. The essence of grief is loneliness, a deep, pervasive loneliness. And it can be really hard to share that with a spouse. That's, that's one reason David and I, in 2009, we started hosting weekend retreats for mm. couples who've lost mm -hmm. children. Mm. We'll have our 41st oh, wow. retreat in January. Mm. Um, for grieving parents. And the reason we started that was we just saw how much pressure grief puts on a marriage, especially the, the death of a child, and how husband and wife can grieve very differently mm -hmm. and, 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 and what it takes to give each other grace, mm -hmm. um, to grieve in our own way um, through that. So. Yeah, I'm sure that's very powerful just to be able to Share that with other grieving people. I mean, just to have oh, that camaraderie. Oh man, I could and, talk uh, with you for an hour. Uh, what happens at these? Uh, it's uh, there's a there's a lot of power in getting around other people who are going through something similar, and finding out you're not crazy, yeah. but that maybe yeah. you're experiencing some of the same challenges. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. It's a great great response uh, mm -hmm. to that. Uh, now, one response you've had to all this is writing a number of books, yeah. uh, including. Uh, your latest, yes. which we've been talking about yeah, uh, I'm here, uh, uh, and um, why? Why did you write this book? Uh, you know, forty days uh, yeah. of prayer. Why? Why did you write this book? Boy, this this book had its origins long ago. It mm -hmm. only recently became a book, but it, I think, maybe the way it began was even in my experiences with Hope and Gabe. I can so remember Joel, um, just a couple weeks into Hope's life, and the the uh, church secretary from our church called and she said, we've put your names on the prayer list and we're asking people to pray and ask for a miracle for God to heal hope. And I said, well, okay. Um, that's not how we're praying. And uh, David and I had, had a deep sense that, that hope, first of all, hope wasn't sick. She was missing something she needs for life. Mm -hmm. And that as a, as a church, we're a little bit uh, of two minds of this. Like uh, things that we're familiar with, for example, if a child is born with an extra chromosome, we don't typically pray and ask God to do a miracle and take away that chromosome that's in every cell. Um, if my child's born without an arm, we don't typically pray and ask God to grow an arm. But because this was kind of unseen at the cellular level, so people were saying, okay, God, do a miracle and, you know, put these peroxisomes in where there, where there are none. Um, but that, once again, that, that there's a, even an assumption in that. I, I, you know, I remember going up to what was supposed to be Hope's Nursery, and I was just, you know, I felt like I finally had a moment to pray myself. And I began to formulate a prayer. And, and in my mind, I felt like I'd been so generous to God to be willing to say that hope wasn't going to live a long life. I thought, okay, I, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask God to give hope as long a life as possible. That didn't seem like asking too much to me. Mm -hmm. And so I just began to formulate that prayer. And then I was just like, but wait a minute. What if a longer life isn't better for her or for me? So then what do I pray? And I just, I just began to pray, okay, Lord, what I'm asking you for is the grace to accept the number of days that you give to her. Um, but I think the most profound thing that I began to learn, I mentioned earlier that whenever you go through something like this, you have the question, why? And uh, some people will say you can't get an answer to that question. Um, some people look for a very philosophical answer. Others will look for a circumstantial 
answer as in like I saw this good thing happen as a result of this bad thing and so therefore I'm willing to accept it right there's my yeah, answer to why sure. well my search was scriptural I want to go to the Bible and say, why Lord and uh, why I mean the first answer I found it's right at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 3 where we we see this curse on the serpent and on the ground that so infiltrates all of creation. It's going to impact uh, this man and woman's relationship, even her childbearing. There's going to be a pain in childbearing as a result of that. And so here in the Bible, what I saw, there are, there are some reasons why instead of, in, in terms of cause, and that to me would be the primary one. Um, I would also see, you know, we see Satan is very active in this world and he's got a tool. He, he's got an aim. We see it in the book of Job, don't we? His aim is that he would alienate us from God. And the tool he oftentimes uses is suffering. So there's that supernatural suffering caused by Satan and evil. But it's interesting, this question, why? Because in the Bible, why? Sometimes we're talking about cause, what caused this? But why can also be answered in terms of purpose. Mm -hmm. I think about the disciples when they come around Jesus and he's just healed this man who was blind from birth. And they say to him, they say to Jesus after the healing, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And so their question is all about cause, right? They think they know the cause. It was sin. And they just want to know who it was, to who, who to blame, right? Um, but listen how Jesus answers, because he doesn't answer in terms of cause. He answers in terms of purpose. He says, this happened, that the work of God might be displayed in his life. That was very instructive to me. Yes. And I began to see throughout the Bible that um, the answer to suffering, so many places in the scriptures, it was not a call to pray the suffering away. But how many times in scriptures I would see even these exact words, this happened so that. This happened so that. So I'm like, okay, if God has some good purposes in suffering for which he intends to use suffering, shouldn't that shape how we pray about it? Now, when I talk about this, Joel, I feel like some people mean me, yeah. you know, but, 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 you know, shouldn't we pray for healing and restoration? And I would say, yes. But I would also still say, but don't limit your prayers to that. Don't be constrained to that. Because what the Bible does, it expands our vocabulary for prayer. Mm -hmm. When I hear Jesus say, this happens so that the work of God might be put on display in his life, I see there is a purpose. And that actually gives me something to pray for, for people I love who are suffering. And so, it, so uh, what I do in that book is just take 40 passages of scripture, mm -hmm. passages like that, passages that in James where it talks about these various trials have come so that uh, so that you will develop steadfastness, right? And steadfastness, then full maturity. Okay, if that's God's purpose and trial, then I want to pray for that. Or in First Peter, where it says that um, that that trials have come, it basically says that that um, that the genuineness of your faith would be proven or put on display. Mm. Okay, well, that tells me something I can pray for and pray for, for myself or for someone else. So what I've done with this book, with these passages of scripture, is I just talk a little bit about them and the implications mm. for how what that would mean for people we're praying for. And then I take the passage and turn it into a prayer mm -hmm. where, in which you can insert a person's name to pray that passage for them. To pray that God's work would be displayed, put on display in life. To pray that they would experience steadfastness. Mm -hmm. To pray that the genuineness of their faith would be put on display for the world to see. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I have in there, which is kind of fun, is we put these QR codes with I everyone. Saw that. that was great. That yes, was we did that. Yeah. So you, you could just take your phone, you know, and punch the QR code, and it populates your phone so that you can send a message to the person mm -hmm. praying for you. That's not simply, I'm praying for you. Right. Which is what we hear most of all, right? And on social sure. media, other places, I'm praying for you. But instead, it says, I'm praying John 9, 3 for you today. Mm. I'm asking that the work of God in your life would be put on display for the world to see. Mm. 
So it gives them some scriptural yeah. substance yeah. to what you're praying that hopefully helps them as sure. they meditate on it yeah. throughout that day. Yeah, that's a really, uh, really practical, helpful tool. I mean, I I've hope never seen anything is. like that. It would be, you know, I, uh, I'm in a prayer group right now. We're praying for someone for 30 days. And, oh, awesome. But, but I wish we had that tool because yes. it certainly would give us something. That, and it's, it's a great tool. So I, well, I'm what, using what it myself idea. for mm -hmm. some friends whose yeah. who son is very ill and... Yeah, I mean, I keep, I keep, you know, it's it's an extended time. That's yeah. often the case with people, right? Yeah. And you don't want to be just this broken record. Yes. And I'm loving it that I can, you know, open up that book mm -hmm. and, and and look at the one that seems applicable for that mm -hmm. day and say, this is what I am praying for you today. Yeah. And and the thing is, you know, to hear back from them, I mean, they came and asked me for, you know, 30 copies of the book to give to all the people who are saying I'm praying for you <laughs> sure. because they want them to have some yes. substance to their prayers. Mm -hmm. because they know they want to pray mm -hmm. and all of us want to pray. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes we just need a little bit of help adding some mm -hmm. substance to those prayers, adding to the simply take it away, fix it, mm -hmm. heal, mm -hmm. adding to that, Lord, be at work to accomplish your good purposes in this mm -hmm. and through this. Yeah. You too, can you just talk a little bit more about praying scripture. What yeah. What is kind of your approach to that? How do you take a scripture and turn it into a prayer? Well, let's try. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> let's find one. Well, I'll just turn to what I was looking at uh, on the plane on okay, my way great. here. Sure. I was in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, mm -hmm. which I just love. And it has this, um, you know, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. And right now I'm praying, especially for um, some um, Afghan pastors and wives and families who've been brought here to the States. They were so, I mean, I was praying for them when they were in hiding from the Taliban. Yes. And now I'm so grateful that they're here, but Praise they're God. still, you know, on a military base mm -hmm. and they've got so much going. And, you know, this last week to hear her, her son is sick and that mm -hmm. they were cold and I was able to get some clothes to them, which mm -hmm. made me great. But I'm mm -hmm. still praying for what's going on in their hearts and minds. And so I would take something like this and I would just say, you know, Lord, thank you that in the jars of clay and flesh and blood you have put inside my friends, Shamsia and Ramazan, a treasure. The treasure of the gospel. And you have done that. Uh, you put that in there in their weakness where they don't know the language and they don't have any power and they don't even have any stuff. Mm -hmm. But I believe that through that, you're gonna, your surpassing power is going to be put on display. Lord, they are afflicted, but they're not crushed. Lord, that's because they have you. They have the Holy Spirit inside of them. Um, they are perplexed, but they're not driven to despair. Lord, please save them from despair in these difficult days. Answer their questions in time, but save them from the despair of need. So just yeah. take that and, and, and make mm -hmm. these the words of our prayer rather than, yes. Lord, be with them. Yeah, that's powerful, isn't it? To be able to take it, God's it word helps and me. It helps me. Yeah, oh, that's wonderful. It's a great, great, and I think that's what's great about your book is that you are providing people with, with some biblical prayers in regards to, of course, this, this topic of suffering. And Somebody asked well. me, she yeah. said, I got through all 40, now what do I do, start over? Yeah. And I was like, you've got the whole Bible. <laughs> <laughs> <We're actually laughs> so pretty, wherever you are, <laughs> sure. um, yeah. pick it up and begin to train yeah. yourself to do this. Sure. Yeah. But what is it about 40? The Why, why 40? <laughs> I mean, that's... <laughs> Well, there's a lot of 40s in the Bible, <laughs> there are, aren't they? There, there sure are. It seemed the right length for a book, Joel, if you're going to push me. <laughs> but there is something about 40 in the Bible. I, mm -hmm. I, I went through a while ago, actually made a list of all the 40s. I didn't get as far as figuring out all of what it means, but there is a sense of, you know, of completeness mm -hmm. and God's purposes being accomplished in 40 days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's true. There's something very powerful <laughs> about that. Oh, that's great. Well, um, uh, and we've talked a little bit about, I guess, the why of suffering. But one thing I did notice in your book, when you have these 40 different passages, to a certain extent, they do answer, and you've talked a little bit about this, the why of suffering. There's yeah. this kind of apologetics question. Why does God allow suffering? Maybe in your study of, of this and even thinking about this, are there any things that have really struck you as to why God allows 
suffering and how can we communicate that in a, I, I, sometimes mm -hmm. it can come across as a, uh, I don't, we want to be holier than thou or coming across in a way like, you know, your, mm -hmm. your suffering is, is, is because of this. What, how can we communicate yeah. kind of the whys of suffering in an apologetics way, but in a way that's, I guess, down to earth and real in that sense? Uh, well, I think there's no singular answer, but yeah. I think there would be a number of them. But I immediately think, I mean, who else do you think of in the Bible when you talk suffering except for Job? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. you know, here's this man who had everything. He has seemingly the perfect life. He's an innocent sufferer. Mm -hmm. um, He's got all these bold questions for God in the midst of it about how God works and what he's doing. And so, it, it, but mainly what he wants to do, he wants God to show up and vindicate him, mm -hmm. basically to tell everybody it wasn't some great sin mm -hmm. on Job's part. Um, and I think also to explain himself. And, and then God does speak. You get to the end of the book of Job and he speaks from this whirlwind. Except he doesn't answer any of Job's questions. Um, instead, he's just like, you know, well, where were you when I made the world? You know, mm -hmm. and um, listen, I'm the one who made Leviathan. You know, yeah. I, 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 I control evil. And, mm -hmm. and what's stunning to me is, is the way that Job responds to that. He, he's not, he doesn't express any disappointment that God has not articulated all of the reasons for why he allowed this suffering in his life. He responds in Job 42, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Um, he says, therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Um, he says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye has seen you. So here's Job. It's like he puts his hand over his mouth and says, you know, I was talking about all these things so grandly. And, and really, I, 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 don't, I don't really know anything. But as God has revealed himself, he, he, he didn't reveal answers to his questions. He just revealed himself. Mm -hmm. He revealed himself as the creator and uh, as the righteous judge, the one who is sovereign and all power. And Job's response simply is, I, no plan of yours can be thwarted. He, he submits to God in the midst of what he can't understand and explain. Mm -hmm. And he believes, though, that he can trust God with it in the midst of it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, Joel, that that's, that's what we need. Mm -hmm. Is that sense in we need sometimes we just we just want to demand so many answers from God. I'm always kind of amused when someone says when they get to heaven, they've got all these lists of questions. You know, first of all, I think, you know, we are gonna see things more clearly. Mm -hmm. We'll we'll have our perspectives will be sanctified, mm -hmm. I think, so that we'll see mm -hmm. things more clearly. But in terms of answering why, I, when he says here, I had heard of you but the hearing of the ear, I think about, okay. This is a person, I mean, at the beginning of the beginning of Job's story, we see he's offering sacrifices, right? He's very concerned about his sin, or he says, even if my kids have, mm -hmm. they might have sinned, and so I'm going to ask for a sacrifice for him. So he's clearly, he knows a few things mm -hmm. about God. And yet here he says, but I only, maybe he thinks I only knew about this much of you, right? Mm -hmm. My ears had heard of you. I had a sense of knowledge of you, but now my eyes have seen you. And so what was it that helped his eyes to see him? You know, God somehow in suffering, he makes us desperate to see who he is. I think before then, we can kind of settle for Sunday school answers and settle for a shallow understanding of who God is and how he works. And I know in my life, when, when I say things were called into question, I don't mean that I doubted my faith. But I just, you know, in, in the, that time with Hope and Gabe and following their deaths, I just went back to the scriptures, these scriptures I had studied my whole life, and they all, a lot of them sounded different. Mm -hmm. Different things stood out to me. And things I thought I had figured out, I, I had to revisit and figure out. I think also, Joel, we just don't know how much in our time, in our day, and where we are, how much we have absorbed of the health and wealth gospel. Mm -hmm. This idea that 
we somehow attach ourselves to God and then he is at our beck and call to make our lives smooth and easy and that the goal of the Christian life is actually to get our prayers for that smooth, easy, problem-free life answered by him Mm -hmm. and that somehow if he doesn't, he has failed us. I mean, that's just a misunderstanding of what the Christian life is all about. Mm -hmm. I mean, open up the Bible. You're not going to find anyone who loves and trusts God who hasn't suffered significantly. And even, I, I've just been working on a book on Revelation, and uh, I just completed that. And, oh, it's so stunning when you get to the book of Revelation. Here's this picture of all of these who have been slain for the, mm. their testimony to the Word of God. And they're there, and they're in God's presence. And it says, you know, they're under the altar, and they're crying out, and they're saying to God, how long? And interestingly, once again, they want to be vindicated. You know, how How long? And, and you read that, and you want to hear God say, well, I'm going to go take care of that right now because we can't have any of that. That's not what he said. He, you know, he says basically, you know, you have to wait until the full number mm-hmm. of those who are going to give their lives for the cause of the gospel is going to co- come in. So where do we get this idea that somehow any time we suffer, it's outside mm-hmm of God's plans and purposes for us yeah. if we're a believer. It just makes no sense. It's not it's not from the Bible. Yeah. 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 C.S. Lewis says uh, some of the effect that if you aim at heaven, you get earth thrown in. Mm, I love if you aim that. at earth, you get nothing. And um, there's this idea, I suppose, of being heavenly minded. I think in, in your book, some of the passages deal with this idea of we do have an inheritance. Yes. A future. How does that play into our you know, how, how do we view our inheritance when we're in the midst yeah. of earthly pain and suffering and it seems interminable, it seems like it's going on forever? How, do, how, do, how can that give yeah. us some hope? Well, it sounds like a, a very C.S. Lewis thing would be to say <laughs> that um, God talks about this weight mm-hmm. of glory, yes. right? Yeah. That, um, that we've got these light and momentary mm. problems, yeah. but there's a weight of glory coming. Mm. You know, here's the thing. The only way you and I are going to believe that is we, if we saturate ourselves mm-hmm. in what the Bible tells us mm-hmm. about the transitory, temporary nature of this life mm-hmm. and about the eternal life to come and its weightiness, its riches, mm-hmm. its abundance, its satisfactions, its joys, its mm-hmm. intimacies. Mm-hmm. and. If you and I, and how easy is it for us this these days to mostly saturate ourselves with the world? Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm constantly mm-hmm. struggling with how much time I'm spending in front of screens yeah. and how much I'm taking in without sometimes taking stock of how it's shaping what I value mm-hmm. and how mm-hmm. I feel and what I think, yeah. right? And we need a, we need another voice of truth, yeah. another perspective, another vision of what's worthwhile mm-hmm. and what's worth waiting for mm-hmm. and what this Christian life is all about. And you know what? We're just not going to get that from a 25-minute sermon once a week no. and have it really change how we yeah. walk through this life. And, um, and I tell you what, it won't prepare you to suffer. No. won't prepare you to suffer. Mm-hmm. You cannot expect to just be a Sunday-only Christian in terms of taking in God's Word, thinking it through, um, and think that you're going to be prepared when the hard things happen. Yeah. Because instead you'll discover you've been discipled by the world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the world says, grab for all the gusto you can get. Right. And the world says, God can't be trusted. Mm-hmm. That's just a silly idea for fools. Yeah. And so we need God's word to uh, cause our roots to go deep into who he is and what he has promised and to set our hearts on that, what he Mm -hmm. has promised. So much so that we find we're able to let go of things in this life because we're so confident Mm -hmm. of what he's promised us for the next. Yeah, Yeah, that's, that's that's beautiful. You mentioned this idea of being oftentimes discipled by the world. How would you 
define biblical discipleship and, and what does that look like? Hmm. Well, I just do think we're in a crisis of discipleship right now. Don't you feel that way, Joel? Yeah, very definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I feel it as we've just seen what's happening in the church in mm -hmm. terms of uh, conflict and pri mostly priorities mm -hmm. about what's really important to people about the mm -hmm. church. And mm -hmm. sadly, it oftentimes seems to be more about politics yeah. than about the scripture. Mm -hmm. And so what that says to me is that, that we are more uh, discipled by whatever cable news channel we watch. We yeah. probably spend more hours a week discipled by cable news, mm -hmm. some of us, or radio talk shows mm -hmm. than we do with the scriptures. Mm -hmm. That's just scary. Yeah. And, um, and so it, I think it just means we all just have to be really purposeful in taking God's word ourselves, not just the quick read for a little inspiration for the day. Mm -hmm. Sometimes maybe it's just that. Investing some time, bringing the best of ourselves, our minds. We want to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mm -hmm. I, I, I tell women, bring your curious mind to the Bible. Mm -hmm. Don't just always be spoon-fed by what somebody else writes in a book. What's something you want to figure it out? And open up your Bible and figure it out. Um, that's the kind of, kind of approach we need, I think, to God's Word. Um, to truly be discipled. And so what we probably need to be, there probably needs to be a brother and sister part of that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. In community, where we're talking about the Bible and we're challenging each mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. in the best of ways and praying for each other. Mm -hmm. um, in community, we're sometimes able to see ourselves and see the world around us mm -hmm. in a way that we might not have on our own mm -hmm. and so doing that with some other people can be helpful and then to when we go to church go to Sunday school mm -hmm. you know be in Bible study and and don't just check out your mind during the sermon but be looking at the passage look at the passages around it take some notes think about what the pastor's saying note does your pastor, how does your pastor get to the gospel in whatever passage you're in? And if he doesn't, maybe you need to be somewhere else. <laughs> and then, you know, if he goes to the table from there, perhaps, and, and presents Christ to you, um, and you take in the elements of the body and the blood of Christ, savor them, and ask God to allow that truth, that his atoning death and glorious life and this new covenant he's invited you into ask god to use that to nourish you in the deepest of ways and to change you at the core of who you are that there would be an ongoing fresh new christ-like change in your life i think it could be so easy to just kind of settle on our laurels of that one time when we came to christ a long time ago and he did this work way back then and, and now we can just be right just on a just kind of an easy road. Now we're mm -hmm. just going to skate the rest of the way to heaven instead of all continually, vigorously, hey, Christ, I want to feed on you and I need you to show me areas in my life that are not pleasing to you. Um, I told you I was reading this morning there in 2 mm -hmm. Corinthians in chapter 4 and then gets to one of my favorite verses in 2 Corinthians um, in chapter 5. I think it's 5, 9. Mm -hmm. Uh, it says, so whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Hmm. Yes, that's what discipleship is about, isn't it? Yeah. It's setting at the center of our lives this aim. Like this is, this is what my life is going to be. This is what my parenting years are going to be about. And this is what my middle-aged years and my retirement maybe mm -hmm. years are yeah. whatever it whatever it is I'm doing this is this is what my life is going to be about my job and this is what my life is going to be out about if I lose my job and mm -hmm. this is what my life is going to be about in terms of our marriage or in widowhood or as a widower mm -hmm. um, if I stay single my whole life I mean, all of these life circumstances no or our lives are meant to all be about the same thing mm -hmm. to please him mm 
-hmm. And then the question becomes, how do I know what's pleasing to him? And that's where discipleship comes in. Mm -hmm. That's great. It's a beautiful definition to think that discipleship is about pleasing God. Our aim is to please God. I like that a lot. And brings it home. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful place. Uh, Well, uh, certainly been, we've covered a lot of ground here. (laughs) It's uh, wonderful. I really appreciate your taking the time to share from your heart and and also your mind and what God has has given you uh, to share with others. Uh, uh, There's a passage that I I put out here in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 that I think reflects a little Mm. bit about what we've talked about. Uh, Paul uh, writes there in verse, beginning of verse 3, he said, Blessed be the God Mm. and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort Mm -hmm. too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. And uh, you've uh, certainly... um, been a wonderful example to us and, and your husband just in sharing uh, out of your own sorrow uh, the comfort that God's given you and that's overflowed in the lives of others and that's our prayer that that will continue for you and you. David and, uh, and, and, uh, and your family and uh, uh, our prayer for all of us is that uh, we'll be able to take what God has given us and share with others. So thank you so much, uh, Nancy, for, for this time. Thank really you, Joel. Appreciate it. Love being with you. Wow, what an amazing interview with Nancy Guthrie. Uh, As I said before the broadcast, one of the most inspiring, moving interviews I've done, and I hope that you as well were touched. Uh, I would do encourage you uh, to pick up Nancy's book. It's entitled, again, I'm Praying for You, 40 Days of Praying the Bible for Someone Who is Suffering. This is one of the most practical tools you'll ever find in coming alongside others who may be hurting. And something you may want to do as well, just take a moment this evening and and ask the Lord, is there someone in my life right now that that God is calling me to come alongside? Someone who may be hurting, someone who may be suffering. And if so, the Lord puts that person on your heart. I encourage you to begin praying for them, reach out to them. And you may consider uh, using this book as a tool to help you in in doing that. Uh, The CS Lewis Institute is is blessed to be able to put on events like this uh, and uh, Uh, We're able to do many things uh, in this ministry around the world due to the generosity of people like yourselves who give financially to support this work. And so I'd like to ask you to prayerfully consider making a gift tonight via our website or text. And the information on how to do that will be available on the screen following our broadcast. As well, uh, information on the publications and uh, and the programs of the Institute will be available on our website at cslewisinstitute.org. May God bless you. And may he equip you to come alongside those who may be suffering in your family, church, neighborhood, or workplace. God bless you, and good night.